You're watching The Daily Decrypt. Welcome to Currency Competition, bitches. I am your host, Amanda, and today's episode is brought to you by BitShares. Today I've spoken with Vlad Zamfir, who is the designer of software called Casper, which is intended to take the Ethereum network from one that is mined in proof of work to one that is mined via proof of stake. Many of you chimed in via Reddit with the questions you wanted me to ask Vlad, and your wish is my command. Tell us a bit about your background and how you be how you came to be a developer at Ethereum. Well, firstly, I'm not really a developer. I'm more of a researcher. Okay. Um, and I kind of like I like more like design software than actually implement it. Okay. Um, my background is in mathematical statistics. Um, well, most of my background, I guess, now after having been in the blockchain space, working pretty much full time for two years, um, I guess I have more background there. I mean, before the blockchain space, I was uh, doing inference and mathematical statistics. Okay. Um, with a focus on small sample sizes and avoiding overfit. Okay. And how did you come to be connected uh, to Ethereum's core developers? Well, so I met Vitalik in Toronto back in like March of 2014. Um, and then April, um, I mean, Ethan, who is now working at Eris and moving to Tendermint, uh, won a hackathon where uh, by, by making a their Ether DApp, like basically it was called Crypto Schwartz. And from there, from then on, I became much more involved with the community, um, you know, the foundation okay. and broader community. And so for, uh, I, I know that f even before the Ethereum network launched in its initial stages, um, they had wanted to switch from proof of work to proof of stake. And so uh, were you approached for to to create a solution for that? Or did you approach the core team with your idea of a solution? So, I mean, um, at first when I started working for at Ethereum, I was doing like reputation systems and kind of more infrastructure stuff, uh, like uh, on for like a layer above the, pro of the consensus protocol. Uh, and I uh, spent a bit of time working on blockchain scaling uh, uh, but at this point, I didn't really believe in proof of stake at all. I didn't think it worked. I thought it had like fundamental problems that couldn't, couldn't really be solved. Uh, and then in September, uh, September 2014, I kind of realized that proof of stake actually can be fundamentally secure. Um, uh, mind sharing, secure. mind sharing your your thought process with us. What were your initial doubts, and then what was it that changed your mind regarding proof of stake? Sure. So. Initially, um, I had basically like the classic problems, right? The long range attack problem, the costless simulation or state grinding problems, uh, or the nothing at stake problem. Just kind of like the, you know, the fundamental like problems of proof of stake that, that like people in the proof of work community kind of still generally believe in. Um, and then what I, what I kind of realized was that um, by using security deposits, um, kind of ensure that a signature is meaningful for some duration of time. And additionally, we can rely on it only during that time when the deposit is placed behind that key. And so we can, we can basically, I, I kind of realized that, you know, it would be possible to do the economics using kind of only signing and security deposits. Um, okay. And I'm already quite satisfied that the reason that Bitcoin works is because Bitcoin has a price. So Bitcoin has a price, which makes the hash rate be pretty high, which means that it's secure, which means that I can continue having a price. So the kind of self-referential, self-bootstrapping thing, where you kind of need to assume that you start off with consensus and with these kinds of, these units having a price in order to prove that the consensus can be maintained. Um, that's something I was already comfortable with because, I, in my view, um, proof of work does that. Uh, and so I was just able to convince myself that with security deposits and signatures, basically I could um, accomplish a lot with proof of stake. Um, this, the reason that you can actually do a lot more with proof of stake than proof of work is because um, you have a direct control on the anti civil mechanism. It's like in the protocol, and you can like you know take and it. Will, away. will you uh, briefly tell us what a civil attack is, so that we can uh, visualize what an anti civil mechanism would look like? Sure. So a civil attack is basically when an adversary um, comes onto a public network and introduces a lot of nodes. You know, perhaps behaving correctly until it has a majority or a very large supermajority of the nodes, and then it would switch to bad behavior in order to kind of uh, sabotage the network. Mm -hmm. 
So essentially, um, the civil attack problem was solved by Bitcoin by using this scarce resource, uh, which is like difficult for civil to get because it's scarce. Civil can't just like multiply it by running up new nodes. Um, and that resource was the hashing power, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in, but, but in general, the idea of using economics as a civil resistant force uh, makes a lot of sense because um, if something is scarce, it can't be easily copied by a civil attacker. And civil attacker, you know, relies on the fact that it's like basically cheap to spin up lots of nodes. You know, the the fact that we have the asset which acts as an AT civil mechanism in the protocol um, means that we can do things like specify, you know, policies about when uh, which players lose how much money for, you know, uh, different outcomes. Okay, so, so this takes us directly. Um, this takes us directly into Casper. Uh, so I would uh, just like to start with a fresh question, um, which you were already going into, which is give us a basic overview of Casper in, I've had specific requests to keep it in in uh, ELI5, explain like I'm five terms. Uh -huh. So in an explain like I'm five way, not that any of this could actually be explained to a five-year-old, but uh, do your best. Uh, with just a general overview of Casper and what it's intended to do. First, let's start off uh, by talking about like the intention. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing that Casper is trying to do is essentially act as like uh, it's essentially a consumer protection policy for Ethereum for the users and developers uh, against and like defending them and pro providing them assurances that the people who are maintaining consensus uh, can't uh, undermine their guarantees and when they do that it's expensive for them so you know when we analyze bitcoin we usually say okay you know an adversary won't have more than this proportion of resources and therefore they won't be able to pull off an attack um the thing that i do additionally on top of that analysis in casper is to ask you know say they do have enough resources to conduct an attack then how much money would they be losing or or, or profiting from conducting that attack so in bitcoin for example you know, if um, two thirds of the miners censored one third of the miners, uh, each one of those miners that are in the censoring kind of coalition has its uh, profit go up by 50%. Well, I mean, because its revenues go up by 50% and uh, they don't need to necessarily hash any harder because the difficulty would just adjust to exclude the third. So in, in Bitcoin, you know, if an attack is successful, it's highly profitable, right? If you double spend, if you censor, you can make a lot of money from doing that. Um, one of the main design criteria in Casper is that it should be uh, expensive for an adversary uh, to conduct even a successful attack. Okay. Um, so the main thing that we do is basically have adversaries, have the validators pledge their deposits on the fact... And a validator is a the equivalent of a node or is a node, is that correct? So it's actually a mi it's like the equivalent of a miner. So it's not just... Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really like a node that can validate transactions and which has a security deposit in order to, which gives it the right to basically like produce blocks. Okay. So when you use the term validator, you're talking about a, in proof of stake, a miner and a node are one and the same. So we're talking about somebody who's running a node, is acting as a miner and has a security deposit in place. That is a validator. Um, so, uh, so really what we usually, we usually call them bonded validators. Bonded validators. To be a little bit more clear that you know maybe you can validate without being bonded. Got it. Uh, but uh, but you know bonded validators has a lot of syllables in it, so we often just say validators. Okay. Um, and basically the the story is that like uh, to produce a block in Casper, you have to place a security deposit, and then you have to engage in this process of uh, essentially placing bets on whether blocks will be included in some, in the future histories of the chain. And if you do something like revert revert history, um, then you know you'll have to be betting against yourself in a sense, right? So you'll lose money because you you were previously to build the canonical version of history, you said, oh, you know, I bet my deposit that this will be uh, the version of events, and then when you produce your your other fork, um, in order to say revert history, uh, you would be betting that some other thing would. Would be the would be the canonical versions of events, but both can't be true, uh, and so you're going to lose money, uh, regardless. Okay, and uh, I have um, some more detailed questions uh, about what you've just mentioned. Before we go further, 
uh, tell me, so like the, say the moment that Casper is, is deployed into the Ethereum protocol, uh, the actual switch from proof of work mining to proof of stake mining, do you, is, is this going to be like instantaneous? Like, is there going to be a moment in time at which GPUs and CPUs mining Ethereum uh, simply stop? Or what does that switch look like? Basically what's gonna happen is, uh, you know, every client, every Ethereum client will download this upgrade, which will say that at some future height, uh, the like consensus slash authentication mechanism changes from this proof of work to the proof of stake version. And okay. so basically there will, there will be a, like a last block, a last proof of work block, followed mm -hmm. by a first proof of stake block. Okay. Um, and you know, there, there, we do, we do that. We definitely need to make, to put a bunch of thought into how to do it as smoothly as possible. Um, but you know, we, we generally understand how to do these kinds of hard forks, uh, because it's, it's basically a coordination problem that we can solve provided that people will install the software and that we have like, and that we have a consensus protocol to begin with. Okay. The only concern is that uh, the proof of work chain might fork. Uh, and so there might, and so people might disagree about which block is the last block. Um, mm -hmm. But basically what will happen is, um, you know, eventually one of them will win uh, and then everyone will agree on what the last block was. And, uh, and, and then the proof stake validators would finalize it. Okay. Well, uh, if you don't mind, I have a, a few uh, community submitted questions here uh, that I think will act as a, a nice roadmap for us going forward. So let me go ahead and pull those up. Um, so let's talk about uh, how, how many Ether will be, uh, I'll read off the names because I think it will be fun, but Diebendorf uh, wants to know, how many ether will be required to to stake? How many as the security deposit? Right. So uh, there will there will be a minimum. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what that minimum is precisely, I can't say at the moment. Um, uh, most likely, it'll be dynamically adjusted over time. Um, basically, um, the the minimum has to be um, there. We need to have a minimum because if security if people get in with without having many deposits then the cost of screwing up the system will be low. Um, but if the minimum is too high, then we won't have enough people who are able to bond. Uh, and so really what we're going to do is we're going to like target some amount of extra attempt bonding attempts. So there might be like some number of validators that we, that we want to have. And then we'll have like that plus like 30% be the amount that we target uh, using the minimum bond amount. And so okay. if people stop bonding, we might lower that amount. Um, and but, but, but there will almost certainly will be a minimum. Mm -hmm. And is there, is there currently a number, a minimum of, of minimum validators you'd like to have? Um, no, I mean, it's best not to have numbers to argue about until, uh, until it becomes like the last argument to have, right? Uh, okay. After we have all the other protocol details specs, we're gonna start thinking about the parameters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, different people have different kind of back of the envelope feelings. But no one, no one thinks that we should have less than 100 validators. Okay. And um, Diebendorf also wants to know, uh, once this number is reached, as you, and which you say uh, you'd like to come more toward the end, uh, if there are a greater number of people wanting to be bonded than, are, than you desire for Casper, how will the selection process take place to choose from among them? Great, yeah. I mean, basically, uh, we're going to have like an entropy source in the protocol, uh, like a crypto economic entropy source, uh, and we'll just do like sampling uh, in proportion to with your probability of being picked is proportion to the size of your deposit. And this is the plan at the moment, right? We're going to end up we're we're going to target always having more than we need, so that we can make sure that we have some buffer room, right? Because we will, ideally we have like the same number of validators always. Um, yeah, so people don't get scared when the number goes too high or too low or something like that, right? Uh, and ultimately, this is going to be probably based on overhead calculations, um, and the precise overhead figures aren't exactly known because we're exploring different like data structures and algorithms for, uh, for example, the betting rules. Um, the and the, and the betting is mo uh, mostly overhead, really. And do tell me uh, what what the betting is. I'm not sure what you mean when you say betting. 
Yeah, so vetting basically is a process by which validators expose themselves to the loss if something doesn't turn out to be the case. Um, so the way that we come to consensus is by everyone synchronizing their the conditions un under which they would lose their deposits. Uh, so that so everyone is basically going to imagine. Okay, when you mine a block in Bitcoin, you're placing a bet that the previous block will be included in the chain. Okay. Um, and uh, the more blocks are in the chain, the more of the network's effort has gone behind. Uh, that one block that you know every, all these blocks are on top uh in proof, security deposit based proof of stake instead of uh creating blocks which, are, which require this computational expense in order to produce we place our deposits against blocks w uh, in order to kind of give them uh and give clients an economic assurance that those blocks won't be reverted for example uh and the the, the betting process is the process by which uh you ex the validators expose their uh themselves to this kind of disincentive mm -hmm. uh, and, and the what, reason is because they they will like you know it's going to be the only way for them to earn fees mm -hmm. and what would um nbr1 bonehead uh wants to know <laughs> uh what is at risk when staking uh is it all of one security deposit a portion of one security deposit or just the fees and what would one have to do in order to lose what they have at stake? Sure, so I mean, all of it is at stake, but different types of behaviors can uh, put different amounts of it as, at risk. So if you just never do anything, if you just like place a bond and you never validate, uh, then you will lose, you know, some, but not all of your deposit. Uh, if you produce uh, an invalid block, um, or you try to unfinalize a block, um then you will lose your entire deposit um if you if you if you engage in betting so you're actually online and you're and you're engaging in a betting strategy um if you uh if you follow a, a bad betting strategy or if um for some other reason the network can't converge or you aren't you know converging with the network then you do stand to lose some deposit but it will be you know less than if you were offline the whole time mm -hmm. And um, now when you said uh, if one is betting but not validating, one stands to lose one's security deposit, could could one be not validating in the simple case of one's hardware accidentally goes offline? Would that count as not validating? No, what I mean is like specifically uh, imagine it, like when, when I if I were to place a bet on an invalid block, that would be a sign that I haven't been validating and then, and then that basically I've been betting without validating. But if I'm offline, I won't, uh, I don't I'm not going to get that, like, you know, I'm not going to lose my whole deposit because I didn't actually sign an invalid block. But okay. what might happen is there might be a problem with the hardware and you might, and you might, uh, you know, fail to produce a valid block. You, it might, there's something, something might go wrong. Um, and basically the bigger your security deposit, the more you need to put, put checks to make sure that your blocks are valid, your bets are good, you know, that your node is online, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and if now, we're um, of deposits, so like you know, probably just running a node on your laptop will be fine. For mm -hmm. large deposits, you'll probably want something a little bit more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, you might want something like uh, you know a little consensus protocol with, between like four or validating servers, and then like uh, another node that kind of uh, filters everything to make sure that only valid blocks get through, or something like that. Okay. And now, is all of this intended to also bring about a faster block time? Is is that true? Yeah. So um, you know, I want to bring the block down, time down to like one second, you know, or lower. Um, but we're going to start off probably with like four second block time, and then uh, and then we'll, and then we'll we'll basically push it as uh, low as it can go. Uh, so basically, there's like this relationship in Casper, and and I think in in general in uh, availability favoring consensus protocols that the higher overhead you're willing to tolerate the lower latency you can you can have okay and is is there a, uh, a a number that's been estimated of what the overhead might be um we're, we're i mean the overhead is uh basically going to be like linear in the number of blocks and quadratic in the number of uh validators 
Um, although, you know, we, 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 we have lots of like ways to get constant factor speed ups. Um, and basically this is the overhead uh, of the whole network. Not from not for any one validator, right? For any one validator, it would be uh, you know you'd have linear and the number of validators overhead, and linear and the number of blocks. Okay. And uh, this leads me to uh, some questions from Speedmax. Um, he wants to know: Do do validators earn a block reward, or do they earn transaction fees, or both? Right. Um, so this is something that's still kind of in discussion. Um, and my personal preference is that they would earn only transaction fees. Uh, Vitalik and I have ta talked about mechanisms for uh, doing enough issuance to have the amount of bonding that we would like to have. Um, so there are there are there is a possibility that we will issue a variable amount. Um, we haven't really talked that much about issuing a fixed block reward. Um, and, and basically, the, the, main, the main reason for that is that the, um, the economics are actually better when the clients are the only source of revenue for the validators, because then validators can't profit by doing something that uh, would cause the clients to stop making transactions. So for example, if validators like lied about timestamps, they could potentially get block rewards faster. Right? I mean, this is true in proof of work and proof of stake. Um, and uh, if and then clients might be might see these off timestamps and be like, okay, you know, I'm not transacting. But that's but the validator won't care because most of the revenue is the block reward anyways. Um, and so basically, clients will have to kind of reluctantly say, okay, I guess I'll transact anyways because there's nothing I can do. And validators don't care about my transaction fees. Um, whereas if the revenue is entirely by transaction fees, uh, client behavior will uh, greatly influence the profitability of validators. And so we can use client behavior to do things like, for example, uh, make sure that timestamps are correct. All right. Uh, so, would it be safe to say that as of as of now, there is no decision on whether there will ever be a production cap on the number of ether in existence, or or that there is a set rate of inflation, be that steady or declining? Yeah, I mean, we can't. There's no final word on any of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the mo the most of the design um, criteria for the consensus protocol are independent of this, these kind of like considerations of monetary policy and distribution of tokens. Mm -hmm. um, so, and most of the reason that people care about uh, the issuance rate and uh, is because of, is for monetary policy kind of reasons, right? They, they want to know that the currency has certain properties that they like in a currency. The thing that I'm worried much more about is the um, security of the market for uh, basically transaction receipts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Crypto Anarchy wants to know uh, if Ethereum via via Casper is planning to ever deploy a sort of decentralized governance process via its validators the way Dash does via its master nodes? Um, so if there is a decentralized governance platform, uh, it certainly will not be run by the validators. Um, the validators are really like the biggest source of risk to the protocol to all of the guarantees we want to provide. I mean, what we want to do is provide a platform for people to deploy applications where they know that any transactions to their applications will be correct and where users know uh, that, you know, they'll always have access to their application and that any transactions they make will be correct and uh, and that their transactions won't be like reverted arbitrarily and all sorts of, you know, anything bad that can happen, it would be because of the, it's the validator's fault, right? Because the validators are colluding to screw the protocol. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I certainly don't think any governance, any governance uh, would be centered around the validators. I mean, uh, what we're trying to do is provide a platform for users and developers. And I think most of the community would agree, rather than a platform that is profitable for the people who run it. Okay. Um, but you know, and uh, I think actually um, this is one area where you know we're trying to learn a lot from Bitcoin. Where Bitcoin has a lot of basically political factioning along uh, lines of you know personal business interests, and mining has, is a very big part of the Bitcoin community because of just the sheer quantity of uh, you know revenue that Bitcoiners are paying to the miners. I mean, twenty-five Bitcoins every ten minutes uh, adds up to a lot of money. Um, 
And as a result, it's, it's actually very, very difficult for the Bitcoin protocol to change in any way that um, obsoletes mining hardware. Uh, whereas, like, you know, the, the kind of road from here to the scalable general purpose, uh, you know, super easy to dev and use platform that we want, you know, is going to have lots of changes along the way. Uh, and, you know, we certainly don't want to be stuck by, uh, stopped by uh, the basically business interests of, um, you know, people who from a protocol point of view and from the user's point of view uh, represent the biggest risk. Okay, and that leads directly into Cat's Five's question, which is, in your view, uh, what is the greatest benefit of proof of stake, and what is its greatest con or or risk factor? Sure. Um, so the the best so so there's there's kind of um, the hmm, the one best benefit. Okay. Or, or, or you can give a, a few. I'll, 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 I'll give. I'll, I'll give. I'll give my top three. Hopefully, in order of, sure. uh, you know, three, two, one. Okay. So low latency. Uh, we can do like lower latency. Um, it, although I guess arguably you can do that with proof of work too, but you end up losing a lot more work. Um, so that's not necessarily the best one. Okay, let's restart. One second. Uh, the, the transaction finality. Okay, transaction finality is like one of the like the biggest ones uh, where you can actually have your transaction not be reverted, uh, revertible. Uh, you can't have that in a proof of work kind of authentication model. Uh, and the uh, the other one is that we can make censorship actually expensive um, because we can see when people are being censored because we have access to the anti civil mechanisms that like kind of governs who can produce blocks. If someone's being censored, we can notice that. And so we can make it expensive. So uh, the fact that you know we have like economic guarantees of censorship resistance is something that um, you know is very, is very much a, a something that exists only in proof of stake land. As far as you know, any number of faults is greater than like fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, and then the on the risk thing, side, the, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Please finish. Yeah, the other thing that people really like uh, and that I really like is the economic efficiency of it. So what we want to do is move from a model where consensus is expensive for everyone, you know, more expensive at any at all times than it might be for an attacker, than an attacker might spend at any time. Um, so, you know, if an attacker has more hashing power for some period of time, then that's like bad because, you know, you're not gonna have your security guarantee during that time. Um, whereas in proof stake model, what we'd wanna do in a security deposit based proof of stake model is move to a situation where um, it's, cheap for everyone except for an adversary during an attack. So, you know, people are paying only a little bit to run the consensus, but then when someone does something really bad, they pay a lot. Um, and that's much more, it's a much more efficient model um, because instead of having to spend all the time more than an adversary might at any time, we can spend like a little bit and then the adversary can spend a lot when they want to attack. Um, so the kind of, there's it's just like, much more secure, right? I mean, I worry a lot actually about double spends, censorship, a lot of problems that exist in proof of work. Uh, I think that there are like super real problems that will happen. Um, and, uh, you know, with this kind of protocol, we can do, we can do a lot better on a lot of fronts, especially with transaction reversion. I mean, uh, finality is something that you just don't really get in proof of work, uh, but you can have in proof of stake. And actually, uh, actually you, you need to have for a good proof of stake protocol. Okay. And then what about the risks or possible complications in proof of stake? What do you envision there? Yeah. Um, so the main um, difficulty with proof of stake is the conceptual and implementation difficulty. Um, because this kind of like modern proof of stake protocol uh, tries to get like very large coverage of Byzantine faults with disincentives. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of cases there's a lot of it, there's a lot of edge cases and there's a lot of uh, kind of reactive stuff that needs to happen. So if someone produces an invalid block, then someone who sees it needs to either forward it to someone else or produces a type of transaction called an evidence transaction, which would lead to the forfeiture of their deposits. Um, and I guess, I guess what we could talk about is like the failure modes, like what could go what could go really wrong. Um, there are basically, I guess there's two main failure modes to kind of worry about. Um, one of them is consensus failure due to finality. 
Uh, so whenever you have finality means that like clients will refuse to accept the blockchain that doesn't include some some block some hash. Okay. Um, then uh, it, so if you have like a network partition and a supermajority of Byzantine faults on both sides, you can have you know uh, you can have two different clients on different sides of a partition, each finalize a different block, uh, and then they'll never be able to come to consensus once the connection remerges. Re but that does require a very large number, you know, a finality threshold number of nodes to be uh, finalizing the blocks on either side. And the finality threshold is, you know, something like, you know, at the very least 67%. Um, and so you end up having a lot of security deposit loss from that, but you will have consensus failure. Um, another kind of concerning thing uh, might be if, uh, if some validators do manage to censor, so you get a sufficiently large proportion of the, um, pool that you could actually censor transactions, mm -hmm. then you can censor evidence transactions, you can censor bond requests from other validators, uh, and you could basically have like a monopoly on the validator set, uh, which you could then use to do something like maybe jack up the fees um, and, you know, undermine user guarantees in various ways. Uh, and, you know, for both of, both of these, um, like for both of these kind of failure modes, uh, the last recourse would be a hard fork. Right. I mean, if there's if there's a network partition and finalized finalized block on both sides, then one side is going to have to hard fork to join the other. Uh, if there is um, you know censorship going on, uh, then you know despite all of our best efforts to stop it, stop it. I mean, because we do do a lot in the protocol to stop censorship, uh, then we could potentially like hard fork and remove these validators from the validator set. Um, there are. Um, and you know, some people find that rather unsatisfying. Uh, but for me, the important thing, is, the important question to ask about security of these protocols is, mm -hmm. um, you know, what what can an attacker do? How much does it cost the attacker? How much does it cost the community? And what can the community do to recover? And um, you know, having to do a hard fork while inconvenient and potentially politically difficult, uh, you know that. I think is much better than a very long history reversion. Uh, and it's certain, and the nice thing about it is that it, uh, it, it, it happens at very little like economic cost to the community, whereas there's a lot of economic costs to the adversary. Okay. Uh, so I have just a few questions left then. Um, pseudonymous Chomsky uh, wants a, like a brief uh, explanation of what the user experience will be for a validator. So, Basically, what hardware do I run? I think you had mentioned that it would be possible to do this from a laptop. And basically, what interactions are required from me via software or not? Right. So it does vary for large and small validators. Okay. But essentially, what you need to do is have um, a correct validator online all the time if you want to be as profitable as possible. You know, just like if you have your proof of work miners offline, you're, you're kind of losing money. Um, if you have your validator offline, you'll be losing money. Um, and so you need to have like a correct validator online as much as possible. Now, what it takes to make a correct validator, uh, in, in basically in like, in practice, it'll probably be okay to just run like Casper node, uh, on like one computer, you know, just probably won't even need to be that strong at first. Um, but, um, if you're sticking with a lot of money, what you're going to want to do is have a whole lot of precautions to be really sure, you know, um, because on top of worrying about your thing being offline, you also need to worry about being hacked. You need to worry about it producing invalid blocks or misbehaving in some way. Like the cost of having a malfunctioning validator could be quite a lot higher than potentially the cost of having a malfunctioning uh, ASIC. I guess, you know, in a case where an ASIC malfunctions and it overheats and burns and becomes unusable, is that's basically the worst case for the for Casper as well. Okay, and B Chain wants to know um, when a Casper white paper will be published. Yeah, so uh, that's definitely a great question. I mean, the, the the reason that it hasn't been published yet is basically because we have different design ideas for different parts, and we're kind of comparing them. And uh, you know, so Vitalik right now is working on proof of concepts for um, like basically the simplest version of Casper that he can imagine. I was working on a white paper for basically a version of Casper that has a lot more, uh, kind of a lot more guarantees, but a lot more protocol complexity. 
Um, and I think what, what basically what's happening is we're coming or we're finding common ground in ways to move from like the simple, simple with less guarantees to more complex, to more guarantees. Um, I guess, you know, once research comes to basically like a, a point where, um, you know, I can write a white paper, Vitalik and I can write a white paper, then, um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. I mean, so far, every time I've tried and I've done it a few times, uh, things end up changing and then I end up having to go back and it becomes dated, you know, within a month or two. Okay. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but certainly we're going to have everything be very well documented. We're, we're not going to ask the community to accept a hard fork without proper peer review, uh, you know, uh, work, right? So, so we're going to have like a, you know, white paper for like the general public, but we're also going to have like an academic quality, like paper that's been peer reviewed by like, you know, um, experts in the field, basically. Okay. And uh, Tony McCarp wants to know uh, approximately when Casper will be deployed. No, oh, that's another great question. Uh, essentially, um, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that needs to happen first. Uh, basically, the protocol needs to like stabilize. Uh, we need to kind of produce all the documentation, and uh, we need to like implement the protocol. And, you know, and probably multiple implementations will need to implement the protocol. And the other thing that I've been really uh, working a lot on is. Uh, uh, working, I'm, I've been working towards doing formal verification of the protocol. Um, basically, kind of getting proofs that various parts are correct uh, and have the properties that I claim they have. Um, and this is like a lot of the work, which you know, um, is like it's, it's it's a way to verify things that is kind of in some way more exhaustive of edge cases than simulation. Like some people find like simulation sufficiently convincing. Um, but, you know, I'm really trying to get formal verification of the protocol. And I, I think it would be prudent if we waited for formal verification. Um, although probably what we're, we're going to have is like formal verification of some of the key components. And then the coverage of the formal verification will grow over time. Uh, you know, and then over, during, during that process, we'll probably be able to upgrade the protocol a bunch of times. Okay. So, so no estimation of, of time of deployment oh, yet? Is that know, how? As, as an estimation, you know, um, like a year is like kind of if it's not out in a year, um, I'll be I'll be uh, I, w I will have not worked as hard as I should have possibly, okay. or maybe there's like a lot of, a lot more stuff to do than I thought. But uh, I, I certainly think that you know a year from now we will. I'm I'm pretty sure that a year from now we'll we'll have it. Okay, and a final question comes from Wobbly Bit Five. I believe that's how it's pronounced, um, which is. Uh, have you, first of all, are you familiar with uh, Daniel Larimer's critique of proof of stake that is not delegated? Um, and what, what would your response to his critique be? Which I believe can be summed up as uh, without delegation, uh, it can only lead to centralization. Oh, yeah. Um, so I actually uh, think that the, the important thing when you're thinking about any of these markets uh, is basically the you have you have to look at the like the, the the dynamics of the market and ask whether um you know people who are not in the majority will be represented so um it kind of for me decentralization is kind of an economic concept uh where uh you know instead of having like oligopolistic competition uh, kind of breaks down and ends up being more of like a competitive market where anyone can enter and leave and anyone anyone's say kind of counts um so let me just like take a step back um sure. if if uh so the reason that i would say that casper is decentralized is is because if you say have like 10 percent or five percent of the stake then like your bonded stake matters there's nothing that the 95 percent could do to remove you without really screwing themselves, and like they're ever they have every incentive to allow you in the protocol. Uh, and if you know if they want to produce an invalid lock or something, you have every incentive to snitch on them, and so does everyone else within their cartel. Um, so the kind of economics end up um, determining actually whether uh, someone with a lot of money gets to run the show. Um, in certain protocols, you, as soon as you have a majority, 
no one else's word matters. Uh, and in, in that in that way, I think is like extremely centralized. Um, whereas, like you know, on an economic front, basically with like you know thinking of Casper as like a uh, protection consumer protection policy as like an antitrust policy, you know, we do our I do our I do my best, and we do our best to uh, make sure that everyone is going to be represented. Uh, whereas, you know, in my view, uh, you know, looking only at the fact that uh, it requires resources to earn resources. Um, would would basically let you say that any economic consensus protocol, uh, you know, favors the rich because they'll just make more make more resources, uh, and I think that's like true on some level, um, but I don't. I, but I but I also don't think we have a choice but to use economics in in this consensus protocol, and I think that like very notably, uh, delegated proof of stake has a lot of economic problems. You know, you can buy votes. You know, the highest bidder just gets all the votes, and then it's like super centralized. Um, so, under like an economic analysis, you know, delegated proof of stake falls apart rather quickly. Um, uh, and you know, the wish that the stakeholders will, uh, you know, give the uh, delegate positions to people who, you know, somehow would expand their community or make it more uh, more decentralized, uh, you know, isn't really guaranteed by the protocol at all. Okay. So really what, we, what we're looking for is pro, in protocol guarantees of decentralization that withstand economic analysis. All right. Does that make sense? I don't know. Well, it, it jives very well with the theme of this show, which is currency competition. That is, okay. uh, that is what we are all about. That's what gets us up in the morning. And that is all of the questions that I have for you, Vlad. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to say thanks for your time and thanks for coming on the show. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, are there any links you want to leave anybody with, or anything for for further research or how to follow you? Um, not really. I guess I should mention that um, you know we're, we're, we we have Casper research hangouts uh, every week, and we're starting to make them more and more open to the public. And you know, I think we'll have one like a live one every week now, so okay. anyone can drop in and um, just and listen in to the research discussion on various parts of the protocol. Okay. And how um, would they do that? Is there a URL, or should people just follow you on Twitter? Or I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. Um, right now, I don't think we have like a page for that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just going to be like a different Google Hangout every Monday. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe I'll get in the habit of tweeting it. Uh, that's like that's not a bad idea. Yeah, follow me on Twitter for for news. Uh, <laughs> another thing uh, that I should maybe maybe mention is that I've been working on a lot on blockchain scaling, uh, and that's been pretty pretty exciting. Uh, and so maybe you should expect something from me in that regard sometime soon. All right, right on. All right, well, uh, I guess maybe we'll talk someday in the future via an update. And so until then, thanks for chatting. Nice to meet you. You thanks too. Bye-bye. Today's episode is brought to you by BitShares, a currency which makes multi-signature transactions easy for everybody and offers a fiat on-ramp to its ecosystem via the exchange CCEDK. The next version of BitShares this quarter will also offer confidential transactions to increase the privacy offerings for all BitShares users. You can find out more about the currency, which runs on human-readable usernames versus alphanumeric addresses, at BitShares.org. Welp, the manservant and I are headed to the Free State Project's Liberty Forum this weekend, so you can expect event coverage when we return next week. Have a good one. I'm